Investigators grapple with the case of a sexual sadist who's leaving behind painfully few clues. Even his victim is anonymous. When a woman steps out of her house and vanishes, detectives find evidence that she's never coming back. With no body, no witnesses, and scant clues, the truth about her fate hangs by a hair. A hideous crime comes to light in a remote river, but all evidence has been washed clean. Investigators have no hope of solving it unless the murderer strikes again. Greed, rage, and revenge provide most killers motivation, but some hunt just for sport. To catch these murderers, investigators must follow a trail of scattered clues. Beneath the gaze of California's Sierra Nevada mountains lies the resort community of Lake Tahoe. Clean air and majestic forests instill a sense of harmony. But for one lost traveler, this was the cruelest place on earth. On September 17, 1987, investigators from the El Dorado County Sheriff's Department were called to an isolated spot off the side of an abandoned service road. The young woman had been gagged with a scrap of pantyhose. Investigators found what they believed to be the murder weapon, a strangulation device made from a tree branch and a shred of the victim's clothing that appeared cut with scissors. Unlike a rope or bare hands, a garrote is primarily used for torture. The killer went to a good deal of trouble to find a place to stage his lengthy assault. Sergeant Jim Watson was surprised to find a body in such a remote spot. And at that point, it was just a big question mark in my mind. How did she get here? Where did she come from? A lot of unanswered questions at that point, and, but it was where we started. What they did know was that the killer must have picked this location ahead of time. The remote service road was hard to find, not a place one simply stumbled upon. And it wasn't chosen merely as a place to dump a body. The path was too steep for carrying the victim. The absence of injury to the soles of her feet told detectives that her shoes weren't removed until she was walked down here. Working outward in a spiral pattern, they scoured the ground for additional clues. We began a sweep of the entire area from here up to the highway, which is about a third of a mile. That sweep revealed pieces of clothing that were scattered on various bushes and trees from here up to the main highway. Technicians collected what they believed to be the remains of the victim's outfit, a dress, a pair of underwear, a single shoe, and pantyhose remnants. Not knowing what might be of use later, they also collected a pack of cigarettes and a butane lighter. Some white cord found nearby suggested that the killer restrained his victim before he killed her. Detectives had no clue to the victim's identity, nor any solid leads on her killer. They hoped the medical examiner would give them something they could use. 
The post-mortem examination placed her between the ages of 16 and 21. She had a large contusion on her head, but that wasn't the fatal injury. The ligature around her neck had ended her life. Based on the amount of decay, the medical examiner estimated that she had died two to four weeks earlier. No tissue was found under her fingernails. No foreign fluids were found on her body. Technicians use sticky tape to pick up trace fibers from textiles. They processed every square inch of the victim's clothing and cataloged each shred in the hopes that one day they'd find a source of comparison. But without a suspect, this trace evidence was useless. And until they could identify the victim, the murder investigation was at a standstill. A sadistic predator was free to roam and to kill again. Detectives scoured hundreds of missing persons records, but to no avail. The papers published an artist's rendering of the dead woman. Tips poured in from families and friends searching for missing teenage girls. One by one, each was eliminated. There was nothing to do but wait. As months passed, the missing person search gradually spread up the coast. It wasn't until four months later, in January 1988, that police got a call from a Seattle woman who recognized the girl. Dental records finally gave the victim a name. 17-year-old Darcy Frackenpole was a runaway from Seattle who tried to build a life in Sacramento. She ended up working as a prostitute. Friends last saw her on August 24th, three weeks before her body was found. For a predator looking to kill, prostitutes make easy targets. Night after night, they let strangers drive them into the darkness. Sometimes they don't come back. Investigators looked for similar attacks on prostitutes in the Sacramento area. One caught their attention. Three days before Darcy's body was found, another prostitute had a brutal run-in with a customer. While leaning over to lock the door, the man grabbed her wrists and attempted to handcuff her. But before he managed to subdue her, a police officer cruising in the neighborhood noticed the struggling couple and interceded. After the prostitute escaped from the car, the perpetrator tried to bolt, but he was caught. One good look at a bag found on his back seat told police that the prostitute had gotten away just in time. It contained a pair of scissors, handcuffs, and a garrote assembled from two wooden dowels and a length of white cord. It seemed to be some sort of crime kit. Police arrested the suspect, 48-year-old Roger Kibbe. A furniture maker by trade, Kibbe had a burglary record that spanned two decades. Illiterate but intelligent, acquaintances described him as a quiet man who liked to take long drives at night. He was given an eight-month sentence for assaulting the prostitute. While he was in prison, Darcy Frackenpole had been identified in Lake Tahoe, over 80 miles away, and the hunt was on for her killer. Kibbe's attack on the prostitute in Sacramento and his crime kit gave investigators the haunting suspicion that this wasn't his first strike. They didn't know how many women had made the mistake of climbing into Kibby's passenger seat. They wondered if Frackenpole was one of them. A garrote is an unusual and memorable weapon. Though the one found in Kibby's crime kit didn't resemble the makeshift device used to kill Frackenpole, 
the white cord used in its construction resembled the rope found at her murder scene. And like his assault victim in Sacramento, Brackenpole was a prostitute. Investigators questioned him, hoping that he would incriminate himself in the Frackenpole murder. He denied any involvement. Detective suspicions were purely circumstantial. The only thing they had to go on was the nylon cord. It deserved a closer look. Under the magnification of a stereo microscope, Technicians compared the cord samples from both Frackenpole's murder scene and Kibby's car. Both strands contained the same number of fibers made up of the same weave and pattern. Investigators discovered that this wasn't just household rope. It was parachute cord. They learned that Kibby worked at a storage facility and rented a unit there they obtained a warrant to search it. Oh yeah, right there. It's a skydiving certificate for Roger. They learned that he enjoyed skydiving, and when they removed a photograph from the wall, they made an unexpected discovery. The picture was hanging from a length of parachute cord, exactly like that found at both crime scenes. But it was hardly a smoking gun. Investigators found nothing to definitively link Kibby to the death of Darcy Frackenpole. This relatively common rope would not support the weight of a murder investigation. Unless they found more evidence, Kibby would be out of prison in just a few months and then would probably disappear. But tiny fibers might prove stronger than sturdy cord. Now that investigators had a suspect, they could compare the trace evidence originally collected from Frackenpole's clothing to fibers collected from Kibby. There are many serial type crimes that we don't have blood analysis or DNA analysis. And if there's not bullets or blood or semen, we have no other option other than to look at the particulate or the trace evidence. At the California Department of Justice Crime Lab, criminalist Faye Springer scrutinized the numerous fiber lifts taken from Darcy Frackenpole's clothing. Hours can be spent analyzing one square inch. After three weeks poring over the evidence, Springer found two fibers that stood out because of their larger size. The distinct shape and color of the fibers cross section told her that they were fibers from a blue nylon carpet. Here's where her 30 years experience paid off. She asked investigators to find out what kind of car Kibby had been driving at the time of the assault. A search warrant was executed and the suspect's car was taken in for inspection. Springer was on target. The floor mats were blue. What's more, one had a red stain on it. A sample was collected and sent for testing. The results were disappointing. It turned out to be pink. But the blue fibers from Kibby's car still had forensic value. A sample was compared with the fibers found on the victim's clothing. Not only were the shape and composition of the strands the same, a spectral dye analysis confirmed that they were exactly the same color. Was this proof that Darcy Frackenpole was in Kibby's vehicle? Not quite. The same blue carpeting could be found in tens of thousands of vehicles. If investigators were going to catch Kibby, they'd need something more conclusive. But one strange similarity couldn't be accounted for. Both the fibers from the car and the ones from the victim's clothing were peppered with tiny football-shaped specks. Samples of both were sent to a lab in Chicago that specializes in identifying microscopic contaminants. Until the results came back, investigators had no other evidence beside the parachute cord. As they began their careful scrutiny for something they might have overlooked, they realized that Kibby might have left behind just enough rope to hang himself. In California, Criminalist Faye Springer was trying to use three lengths of rope 
to lasso a killer. She examined the ropes under higher and higher magnification until she noticed something strange. The rope found at the Darcy Frackenpole murder scene had tiny red paint flecks in it. So did the cord from the garrote found in Roger Kibbe's car. So did the sample from his storage unit. Spectral analysis showed that the paint on the three cords had the same chemical composition, including some microscopic black specks that must have gotten trapped beneath the drying paint. It was a powerful connection. So it looked like not only did we have the same kind of cordage, but we had a cordage that lived or existed in the same environment, was exposed to the same kind of contaminants. For all intents and purposes, it was the same rope. But investigators needed more to tie up their case. That's when the call came from the testing lab in Chicago. They had finished analyzing the carpet fibers. The unidentified football shapes found on the carpet fibers were fungal spores, single-celled organisms that could have come from dirt or mold. But there was something else. The lab's powerful microscopes had identified a red spot on the carpet fiber found on the victim's clothes. It was paint. It had the same properties as the paint on the floor mat of Kibby's car. The carpet fibers weren't just similar. They were identical. Both contained the same football-shaped fungal spores and the same paint stains. The victim and suspect had now been irrefutably linked. What about the other one there? Roger Kibby was arrested on April 25, 1988, for the murder of Darcy Frackenpole. By trial time, police had pieced together the details of the victim's last night. She had been working the streets when she accepted an invitation that would turn out to be a date with death. Investigators suspect that after restraining her with the parachute cord, Kibby brought her to a place he'd selected in advance. After cutting up her clothing and torturing her for several hours, he killed her, then scattered her clothes. Roger Kibby was found guilty of murder in the first degree and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. No one knows how many other victims met a fate similar to Darcy Frackenpole's. At least three other murders matching Roger Kibbe's M.O. are thought to be his work. Had it not been for a powerful microscope and some shrewd detective work, the number might still be rising. Roger Kibbe had covered his tracks by heading out in search of strangers, but not all predators hunt far from home. On a brisk October morning in 1992, neighbors saw Laura Hoteling leave the Bethesda, Maryland home that she shared with her mother. The 24-year-old Harvard graduate moved back after college and had no trouble finding a job at a consulting firm. But on this day, she never made it to work. A close friend and colleague went to check on her. Though the back door was open, she found the house empty. Anyone home? Laura? Laura? Someone didn't come to work today. There was no sign of Laura, nor any hint about where she'd gone. She contacted Laura's family, concerned that there was some sort of emergency. They were as puzzled as her friend. Laura's mother cut her business trip short. Neither she nor her son had any idea where Laura could be. She was not the type to run off without leaving word. Serious about her career, Laura was known for her diligence and punctuality. No burdensome secret seemed to be weighing on her mind. She didn't hint about leaving town. 
Her family filed a missing persons report with the Montgomery County Police. At this point, all Detective Ed Tarney could do was a routine check. We checked with the friends. They had not heard from her. She did not leave a note. It was just very suspicious. We also, uh, through the course of the investigation, we checked all her credit cards, bank accounts. There had been no activity. But as missing persons cases go, this was in its infancy. It had only been a few days since Laura Hoteling was last seen. Though there had been no sign of her, there hadn't been any indication of foul play either. Hey, how's it going, pal? Good. Police Good. interviewed the Hotelings' oh, friends, Sorry. their neighbors, their gardener. No one could offer out. any information regarding yeah. the woman's disappearance. After seeing her leave for work the previous morning, there'd been no sign of Laura, nor any indication of trouble at her house. But then, as they searched the woods around the house, investigators found something that told them this was more than a missing persons case. The pillowcase and pillow inside it were stained with what appeared to be blood. When we took the bloody pillowcase back to the house, it matched up with the other pillowcases that were there. And at that time, we were, uh, we knew we had something very, very serious. To find out more about the stains, investigators turned to forensic scientist Susan Ballou at the Montgomery County Crime Lab. I take the pillowcase off the pillow. Okay. Ballou Get first the pillow. tested the stains to confirm that they were made by human blood. We wanted to see if we could pick up a type consistent with Laura. We knew from her donations to the Red Cross facility that she was a type A blood. The blood stain from the pillow was shown to be of the same type. From its bright red color, Baloo knew that she was looking at stains less than a week old. Though her findings could only prove that someone with type A blood had bled on Laura Hoteling's bedroom pillow, it was enough to turn the missing persons case into a potential homicide. Investigators needed to find out what had happened in Laura's room. Beneath the bedspread, they found something strange. There was a flat sheet on the bed, but the fitted sheet was gone. And on the mattress underneath were some faint stains that looked like more blood. Investigators saturated the mattress with a chemical called luminol. When it combines with blood proteins, even those invisible to the naked eye, it glows. Viewed in the dark, Laura's mattress radiated a pattern of blood spots and streaks that spelled murder. There was a large quantity of blood that showed up on that bed. That's when we knew uh, she was, had probably been murdered there in her bedroom. The lack of spatter on the surrounding walls or furniture told detectives that the killer had used the pillow to staunch the blood flow. The absence of a blood trail leading from the bedroom suggested that the killer had either cleaned his tracks or wrapped the body before removing it from the house. Investigators collected fibers and samples of Laura's hair in case they ever had the need to make a comparison. Meantime, technicians searched the pillowcase for any link to the suspect. A crucial detail surfaced. Based on the repeated pattern of triangular smears, they surmised that the killer had stabbed the victim with a narrow, pointed weapon, which was then wiped on the fabric. Hidden in the corner of the pillowcase, Baloo uncovered a more significant discovery. And when I looked at these areas closely, I could see partial impressions of prints on them, which turned out to be what's called a patent print, a print that is made in blood However, there was not sufficient ridge detail to get enough information from it. In its current state, the print was too vague to be used for identification. But criminalists like Baloo have ways of turning faint prints into glaring evidence. 
She applied a protein-sensitive dye to enhance the pattern. We'll see what we can do with it. Now that they had a viable print, all they needed was a suspect. I'm hold this here so I can rinse them off. Mrs. Hodling couldn't think of anyone who would want to harm her daughter. She did recall, though, that their gardener, Haddon Clark, had been fascinated by Laura since his first day on the job. She also told police that she'd discovered her spare key was missing. Clark had worked for the family for several months. During the day, he was allowed in to use their bathroom or help himself to some coffee. Overnight, he lived out of a truck that he kept in a nearby church parking lot. How long have you been working for the hotel? Though Clark denied any knowledge of an attack on Laura Hoteling, his agitated behavior cast him in doubt. It wasn't Clark's first brush with the law. He had once been arrested on a burglary charge. When Clark's prints were compared against the patent print from the pillowcase, they matched. The suspicious gardener had left his print in wet blood on the victim's bedroom pillow. And the only way he could have done that, police contended, was if he had killed her. Though they still had no body, police arrested Clark on November 6, 1992. Inside his truck, along with his gardening tools, they found a hardware store receipt for carpenter's twine, duct tape, and plastic sheeting, ordinarily harmless materials that homicide investigators see more than their share of. Detectives believed that Clark was the killer. Proving it would be another matter. Despite the circumstantial evidence heaped against him, all police had was a bloody fingerprint. Clark's lawyers were already formulating their rebuttal. The homeless man regularly scavenged through trash in the woods. He could have easily left an innocent fingerprint on the pillowcase. It was up to the prosecution to prove otherwise. So at that point, we realized the fingerprint was not going to be the crux of this particular case, and we had to go further. Despite his dubious profile, detectives didn't have a single shred of physical evidence to tie Clark to the murder. And without a body, the case would be nearly impossible to prove. Investigators searched Clark's squalid campsite for a weapon, or even a body, but no weapons were found and the only bodies were the game he trapped for food. Detectives began to scour the place for tinier clues to prove Laura had been there, but realized that finding anything of value in this hovel would be impossible. The trial date was just weeks away. If the prosecution failed to convince a jury of Clark's guilt, they wouldn't be able to try him again, even if the body turned up later. And without any convincing evidence, it seemed their case against the gardener would wither on the vine. The trial date was drawing near, and Maryland investigators needed to find some physical link between Haddon Clark and the victim, Laura Hodling. Because the victim's body hadn't been found, the case would have to hinge on other evidence. Investigators were at a loss to determine what that evidence might be. While they searched the suspect's belongings, forensic technician Susan Ballou continued processing the evidence from the crime scene. In preparation for any possible hair comparison, Ballou inspected more than 90 hairs taken from the victim's hairbrush and made a shocking discovery. When I started to do that, I noticed that one of the fibers I put under the microscope was a wig fiber. And it just jumps out at you. It is so different from an actual hair, and it caught me off guard. May I speak to Ed Tarney, please? Baloo learned that none of the victim's family or friends owned or wore wigs. From receipts found in Clark's truck, investigators learned of a storage facility that he rented in Rhode Island. Investigators realized that his penchant for dressing up might be the one thing that could finally expose him. Ed, what do you have? 
if technicians could prove that the single wig fiber found in the victim's brush had come from one of the suspect's wigs, they would be able to show that he had been at the scene of the crime disguised. Ballou pulled sample hair fibers from each of the 24 wigs and compared them to the single wig fiber found in the victim's hairbrush. After looking at under the microscope at all the different fibers from these wigs, I found one wig that the fiber from that wig had the same color composition, the same diameter. It also had the same internal characteristics as that one wig fiber that I recovered from that hairbrush. Now that Ballou had narrowed her search to one wig, she sent it with the original strand to a crime lab that specializes in hair testing. The last and most definitive test would compare the dyes in both samples. Though indistinguishable to the human eye, each wig manufactured in the U.S. has a unique fingerprint. Each of the approximately 7,000 commercial dyes is trademarked by the company that formulated it. The lab studied the samples under a microscope sensitive to ultraviolet rays. They called Baloo with their findings. They were able to determine that that dye content in the wig, as well as that question fiber recovered from the brush, were in fact one and the same. Clark's defense attorneys couldn't get around this single strand of hair. Realizing he couldn't skirt the evidence, Clark confessed. He plea bargained to murder in the second degree. In exchange for the reduced charge, he agreed to reveal Laura Hoteling's grave, located near his campsite. Clark admitted to having stabbed the victim with a pair of scissors. The autopsy concluded she was also suffocated. Ultimately, investigators pieced together her final hour. Driven by sick obsession, Clark learned that his victim would be alone while her mother was out of town. Using the spare key, he entered the house, smothered Hoteling with a pillow, then stabbed her in the neck. Clark must have rolled the body in the missing bedsheet, then wrapped it with the plastic and tape he'd purchased from the hardware store. He loaded the body in the truck and drove to a clearing near his campsite, where a shallow grave awaited. The following morning, Clark returned to the scene of the crime to clean up and cover his tracks. He figured that by posing as Laura Hoteling, he'd throw any nosy neighbors off his track. His last look in the mirror would prove his undoing. Without the ironclad forensic case against him, Clark probably would have never confessed. His victim's body might still be lying in a lonely grave and Haddon Clark might have extended his killing streak. Thankfully, the devious killer couldn't escape the evidence. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Please hurry, he's trying to kill me. There's no telling where a trail of evidence might lead. Sometimes investigators stumble onto more than they bargained for. At 4.30 a.m. on January 21, 1995, the Marion County, Oregon police received a phone call from a prostitute named Lisa Louise Benson, who claimed to have been attacked. Benson was brought to the hospital for treatment. Lieutenant Bob Stye questioned her about the terrifying ordeal. She had ligature marks across her neck and um, also had an abrasion and the signs of bruising on the back of her neck and had abrasions um, um, on her hands and up on her knees. Her injuries were photographed as evidence. Earlier that morning, she told investigators, a customer had tried to kill her. She'd never seen the man before, but he didn't appear threatening. She climbed into his truck.
He brought Benson to a retail carpet outlet. After roughing her up in an office, he forced her into the warehouse. He tied her to a forklift and told her she was going to die. And then hoisted her, literally hoisted uh, the lift up to where she was dangling with her feet about six or eight inches off the ground. She hung there for almost a minute. Then the rope broke and she fought her way free. The plastic wrap that bound her wrists was taken into evidence. Police learned from the carpet store manager that one employee, Larry Reed, fit the suspect's description. When Reed showed up to work the next day, police were there to meet him. He admitted that he'd picked up a hooker the night before, but when questioned about it, he became evasive and uncooperative. He refused to give any more information without an attorney present. Police heard all they needed. They arrested Reed for the attempted murder of Lisa Benson. A look into his background revealed a disturbing history of assaults on little girls and elderly women. He had been institutionalized more than once, but nothing, it seemed, could tame his instinct to prey on vulnerable females. Reed fit the profile of a sadistic sexual predator, but so far the case against him was based only on the word of a prostitute. To make the conviction stick, detectives needed physical evidence proving that he caused her injuries. They obtained a warrant to search the office where Benson claimed to have been attacked. They found blood spatter throughout the office. The pattern of droplets revealed repeated blows to the body, probably with a blunt instrument. The underside of the carpet disclosed two large blood stains, although the top of the carpet had been cleaned. Criminalists are often called on to build a case from a single drop of blood. In this case, however, they had copious amounts. They found more on the dashboard, glove compartment, and steering column of Reed's car. The evidence was sent to the lab. The results were anything but routine. Tests confirmed that all the samples were blood, but not a drop of it came from Lisa Benson. Investigators in Oregon faced an unnerving predicament. Their routine investigation into Lisa Benson's assault had exposed a much greater crime. Not only was Benson's blood a mismatch, the spatter and saturated carpet didn't correspond to her injuries. Forensics determined that the amount of bloodshed indicated that someone had been brutally murdered in the manager's office. Now they had a homicide investigation with no clues about the victim. They didn't even know when he or she was killed. They did, however, have a suspect, Larry Reed. His manager at the carpet warehouse told investigators that almost two months earlier, Reed had said he needed his carpet cleaned. Reed explained the situation to his boss. Mr. Reed had reported that a customer had come into the business during um, the evening hours of uh, December 7th, um, and that this person had complained about being sick and, and had gone into this office and had thrown up, and in throwing up, he had also thrown up some blood. The story was unlikely, but at least it gave investigators a time frame for the murder. A little research brought to light an unsolved murder in the next county. In December 1994, fishermen noticed something peculiar floating in the Santium River. Closer inspection revealed it was a body.
they marked the location and contacted the sheriff's office. Investigators retrieved the nude body of a woman from the muddy water. Though the water had distorted her features beyond recognition, the numerous wounds to her head were plain to see. Someone had murdered this woman and dumped her body into the river. These murky depths, the killer hoped, would conspire to keep his secrets hidden forever. The medical examiner determined that the victim was around 40 years old. The degree of tissue decay and the amount of mud and algae coating the body told him that she'd been in the water for several weeks. Seven penetrating wounds had fractured her skull, inflicting fatal damage. From the size and magnitude of the wounds, the pathologist believed the murder weapon to be a tool with a hammerhead on one side and a cutting blade on the other. Identifying the victim would be a challenge. Because she had no fillings, there would be no dental records for comparison. And because of her time in the water, technicians were unable to render fingerprints by the standard inking method. But they had other ways. The hands were amputated according to standard scientific practice and sent to the police lab. There, highly detailed photographs of the fingertips were taken. These photographs were compared to a police database of fingerprints from women matching the victim's description. They came up with a match. The fingerprints belonged to Marjorie Lynn Sessions, a 38-year-old prostitute. Detectives from the Lynn County Sheriff's Office, which is south of us, advised that they were working a homicide case involving a woman named Margie Sessions. The detectives from Lynn County advised that um, Margie's lifestyle was one of uh, being involved with the methamphetamine use and uh, prostitution. December 7th, the same day that Reed reported the bloody carpet stain, was the day Marjorie Sessions had last been seen uh -huh. alive. Mm -hmm. Since both women were prostitutes, okay, it appeared and, uh, that his attack on Lisa Benson was part of his chilling pattern. And, we'll get this taken care of. and so it was those two significant um, facts that led detectives to um, kind of put the two cases together. Only a DNA test could definitively link Reed to the murder of Marjorie Sessions. If the victim's DNA matched DNA taken from the blood found at the carpet warehouse, investigators would have their man. It wasn't so easy. The victim had been in the river so long that the water degraded the DNA in her blood. But there was one last chance. In March 1995, three months after her death, the victim's body was exhumed. Technicians extracted dental pulp and bone marrow. From these samples, they generated a DNA barcode. In order to confirm that the DNA had not been degraded, technicians compared it against tissue samples from the victim's parents. The genetic pattern was intact. When tested against the blood samples from the suspect's office, it matched the DNA pattern for every stain collected. The blood work proved that Marjorie Sessions had been wounded in Larry Reed's office and that the suspect had transferred some of the blood to the interior of his vehicle. But it couldn't prove for a fact that Larry Reed had killed her. The only way to do that would be to establish a relationship between the suspect and the dumping of the body. Before they could solve this case, investigators had one more river to cross. In order to prove that Larry Reed had murdered Marjorie Sessions, detectives needed to show that the suspect was responsible for disposing of her body in the river. Scouring police records for similar attacks in the area, they made a crucial discovery. Back on December 7th, the day after Sessions was last seen alive, an illegal dumping report was filed in neighboring Polk County. Residents had reported a man fitting Reed's description, getting out of a pickup truck to dump trash along a roadside. 
we'll make sure we get that tag. The bag, which bore traces of blood, contained blood-stained paper towels. Blood right Mixed among them was a single sheet of plastic shrink wrap. Nearby, investigators found a carpet remnant, also spotted with blood. They had no way to trace whose blood it was or who had dumped the trash there until now. Samples had been saved and were brought to the forensics lab. Each item was carefully studied. The single piece of plastic wrap was compared with the wrap collected from the Benson case. Criminalist Brad Putnam performed the analysis. The first thing we did was look at the class characteristics, the physical characteristics of the plastic. Is it clear? Is it colored? Is it uh, opaque? Can you see through it? Um, we took measurements of the thickness, of the width. Experts couldn't prove that the plastic wrap found at the dump site came from the same roll as the plastic used to gag Lisa Benson. But they were able to prove that it was identical to the wrap found at the factory where Reed worked. It was of the exact same shape, width, and coloring. Now that was real significant for us because uh, we knew Mr. Reed worked as a carpet salesman. We also knew that at the carpet store, uh, he had used plastic shrink wrap on Miss Benson to put around her mouth and around, around her throat. And we had the same type of plastic wrap found at the illegal dump site. The blood found on the carpet and paper towels sealed Reed's fate. It matched the blood found in his office. It had come from Marjorie Sessions. Based solely on forensic evidence, detectives had pieced together the details of her murder, from initial contact to the time her body entered the water. Forensic supported witness statements from the unlawful dumping. Uh, it uh, helped solidify some of the theories that may have been going on and really tied um, kind of a multi-jurisdictional nightmare into a nice tidy package for the prosecution. Police believe that on the night of December 7th, Reed picked up sessions at a bar. As he had done with Benson, he brought her back to his manager's office where things turned violent. Repeated blows to her head ended her life. Reed then dumped the body in the Santium River. Even if she were eventually found, he thought, there would be no way to tie her to him. But Reed underestimated the power of forensics to draw a link with Marjorie Sessions, to coax DNA from the grave, and to turn flimsy bits of trash into an incontrovertible murder charge. Confronted with that much physical evidence, uh, it's pretty hard to deny involvement. Reed was sentenced to 40 years for the murder of Marjorie Sessions and the attack on Lisa Benson. Thanks to the forensics analysis, a case that seemed destined to go unsolved was proved beyond a shadow of a doubt. And a predator who may have gone on hunting for years was stopped in his tracks. Honing their skills with each attack, sadistic killers are some of the most difficult criminals to catch. Today, science is giving law enforcement the edge. With the use of advanced forensic techniques, investigators can build a solid case from the scattered clues they leave in their wake. A quiet Washington state community becomes the backdrop for a string of brutal murders. And all of the evidence suggests that a serial killer is responsible. As investigators struggle to identify a suspect, more bodies continue to surface. In Michigan, the pregnant wife of a promising young attorney is found dead in the couple's home. 
though it appears to be the result of a tragic accident, police are not convinced. It falls to forensic examiners to expose the truth. Solving a murder requires a team of experts whose efforts often go unrecognized. When crime fighters meet crime writers, their story is finally told. And many times, it's a tale stranger than fiction. Bellevue, Washington lies just east of the city of Seattle. It's a thriving community of about 100,000 people who live, work, and play here. But in the summer of 1990, young women began turning up dead throughout the city. On Saturday, June 23rd, Bellevue police received a 911 call. A restaurant employee had stumbled upon the lifeless body of a young woman. Investigators responded to the scene. They found the victim lying among trash next to a dumpster behind the restaurant. She was nude except for a necklace. Her arms and legs were positioned as if she were lying in a coffin. A pine cone rested in her hands. It was clear that the victim's body had been posed by the killer. Technicians managed to locate a single black hair near the woman. But they found no clues to her identity or that of her killer. Bellevue detective Marvin Skeen was assigned the case. He knew this wasn't going to be an easy murder to solve. Most crime scenes, you know who your victim is. In this particular crime scene, we had no idea at all who our victim was, her identification. We also lacked clothing, so we couldn't provide a clothing description when we asked the public for their assistance in determining who the victim was. The medical examiner concluded that the woman, likely between the ages of 25 and 35, had died as a result of strangulation. She had also been brutally beaten and sexually assaulted. In addition to collecting biological evidence, dozens of fibers clinging to the victim's body were also recovered. Though it wasn't much to work with, Detectives forwarded what little evidence they had to the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab in nearby Tacoma. After examining the fibers under a microscope, all that scientists could conclude was that they had originated from the carpet or trunk mat of a car. Next, the black hair collected from the crime scene was analyzed in the hopes it would provide some clue to the killer's identity. Forensic scientist Terry McAdam. You can look at it for predominantly pigmentation helps us to decide which possible broad racial groups it may belong to. From the color, texture, and shape, McAdam determined that the hair had come from an African American male. But having been found among trash and debris, its connection with the crime was uncertain. Investigators knew the best way to find this killer would be to first identify the victim. But no missing persons reports filed in the city of Bellevue matched their victim. We went to the news media, who of course were interested in, this, in the case, asked for their assistance. We also went to teletypes and bulletins to surrounding 
law enforcement agencies asking them to check for missing individuals in their cases. Soon after, investigators got their first break. In a neighboring jurisdiction, a woman had reported her roommate missing. From photos taken at the autopsy, she identified the victim as her 27-year-old friend, Marianne Polreich. She said that she had last seen Marianne three nights earlier as she prepared to go out for the evening. Marianne had borrowed her roommate's necklace. It was the same one found around the victim's neck. Marianne usually spent her Fridays at a bar just a few blocks from where her body was found. The roommate indicated to us that Marianne's personality was one that was a free spirit and that Marianne definitely enjoyed dancing and that she would go to the various local clubs to dance. That was her main purpose as far as recreation. We learned that Marianne was a very hard worker. We learned that also from co-workers and from employers. But the roommate indicated to us that Marianne would not go with a stranger, someone unknowing to her. Following up on the roommate's information, police went to the bar where Marianne spent her Friday nights. The restaurant manager knew her well, and she had been there the night before her body was discovered. Though he hadn't noticed who she was with, he believed she had left in a hurry. Marianne had forgotten her sweater and purse. Investigators collected the items, hopeful they contained some clue to her killer's identity. But the evidence failed to yield any useful information. The investigation into Marianne Polreich's murder was going nowhere. And the caseload for Bellevue detectives was about to increase. On August 9th, 1990, police were dispatched to the home of Carol Beathy. Her ex-husband, Paul, had received a call from his two young children earlier that day. They said that their mom was locked inside her bedroom and wouldn't come out. When Paul came to the house, he discovered his 36-year-old ex-wife, Carol, dead inside her bedroom. It looked as though she had shot herself. When police entered the room, however, it became clear this was no suicide. Though a shotgun lay near the victim, it had not been fired. Instead, the killer had posed the victim's nude body and used the shotgun graphically as a prop. Carol Beathy had been sexually assaulted and beaten to death. But no biological evidence of rape was found. Technicians collected a few black hairs from the sheets. Though robbery did not appear to be a motive, family members later determined that Carol's heirloom ring was missing. For Bellevue homicide detective Dale Foote, the similarities between the Marianne Polreich and Carol Beathy murders had to be more than coincidental. Bellevue is a, is a pretty quiet suburban town, and, and we, we don't have a whole lot of homicides here, so we have two cases with, with women that are openly displayed and they're posed nude. Um, yeah, we're having some questions. Why are these two cases so similar in nature? Is there any connection between them? Do they know each other? Do their friends know each other? Um, you know, did they work together? Did they, uh, you know, uh, attend some of these nightclubs together? We just didn't know. So some of those questions we had to answer and answer real fast. 
To find out if the cases were in fact connected, police forwarded the hairs recovered from the Carol Beathy crime scene to the lab. When examiners compared those to the one recovered from the Marianne Polreich crime scene, they concluded that the hairs had originated from the same person. Bellevue police were now faced with the possibility that a serial killer was loose in their city. Looking to find a common thread between the two victims, investigators began interviewing Carol Beathy's co-workers at a popular restaurant where she had worked as a waitress. Carol's friends could not imagine why anyone would have wanted to hurt her. Though she and her ex-husband Paul were divorced, they maintained a great relationship. And Carol's two daughters constantly showered her with love and affection. Though Carol Beathy would sometimes go to nightclubs, police were unable to establish any connection between her and Marianne Polreich. The two unsolved murder investigations quickly became front page news. Soon, the mystery caught the attention of veteran crime writer Jack Olson. With 10 true crime novels to his credit, Olson recognized that as a writer, this story was too unusual to be ignored. I think the thing that made this case unusual was the posing of the bodies. That is not seen. It is seen, but it's not seen very often. It, it represents some kind of a deep-seated, uh, deep-seated hatred of women. And Bellevue police feared that such a deep-seated hatred would not simply go away on its own. If they didn't identify a suspect in the killings, and fast, it would only be a matter of time until more victims turned up dead. Police in Bellevue, Washington struggled to solve the sexual assaults and murders that had claimed the lives of two young women. The bodies of 27-year-old Marianne Polreich and 36-year-old Carol Beathy were discovered less than two months apart. Having found both victims savagely beaten, sexually assaulted, and their bodies posed after death, Investigators had reason to believe that the murders were the work of one predator. But so far, they had no idea who that was or when he would strike next. On September 3, 1990, police in neighboring King County received a 911 call. The body of 24-year-old Randy Levine had been discovered by her landlady. She had been savagely beaten, and her nude body was posed suggestively in her bed. Technicians located a single dark hair near the victim's body. The only item determined to be missing from the room was an antique ring. At autopsy, the medical examiner confirmed that Randy Levine had died as a result of blunt force trauma to the head. Though she had also been sexually assaulted, no biological evidence was found. But the medical examiner did find evidence that the young woman had been tortured. 283 tiny puncture wounds dotted her body. The pattern of some of the injuries suggested that the killer had played a game of tic-tac-toe. Because the Levine homicide happened outside the city limits of Bellevue, its parallels to the unsolved Polreich and Beathy murders might have gone unnoticed. But then, Bellevue police detective Ed Mott received a call from a paramedic who happened to be called to all three crime scenes. Yo, yeah, this is Lieutenant Ed Mott with Bellevue. And he couldn't help but notice the similarities. He says, I'm not a cop, I'm not a policeman, he says, but the last three murder cases I've been to, he says, it's really odd that the three bodies have been posed. 
Bellevue police also learned that Randy Levine had been to a Bellevue nightclub the night before she was found murdered. There could now be little doubt that a serial killer had claimed the lives of all three women. Officers from throughout the area began pooling their resources, desperate to identify this killer before he struck again. The senselessness of the homicides left veteran crime writer Jack Olson struggling for answers. He wondered why these women in particular had been targeted for murder. He could find no rational explanation. And they were perfectly fine women doing exactly what we, we would expect decent young women of their age, 20, 30, 35, to be doing. They held jobs, they were responsible. Yes, they did uh, go to nightclubs now and then. They're admirable people. As the hunt for the serial killer intensified, an intelligence officer with the Seattle Police Department believed he had uncovered a possible lead. A few days after the Randy Levine homicide in King County, a man named George Waterfield Russell was arrested near her residence for impersonating a police officer. According to the reports, when 32-year-old Russell was pulled over for traffic violations, the officer saw him try to hide something under the vehicle. At first, Russell identified himself as an undercover police officer, but later recanted. Suspicious, the patrol officer searched his car. He located a police scanner, a buck knife, and two IDs. Hidden underneath the vehicle, he found a loaded handgun. A check of the serial numbers revealed that the gun had recently been stolen. Russell was placed under arrest for impersonating an officer and being in the possession of a stolen weapon. A records check showed that Russell had an extensive criminal record, which included sexual assaults and cat burglaries. Mostly, George Russell stole jewelry. A further background check revealed that Russell was known to frequent Bellevue area nightclubs, and he had a reputation. Well, George was a charmer, and basically he was liked in the nightclubs. He was a popular man in the nightclubs. He had a good line of chatter. He would sidle over next to the DJ, and they'd have a nice conversation, and then he'd sidle over to the bar and have a nice conversation with the, with the bartender, and then various people, various, uh, usually young women who came under his aura, would sit with him, would buy him drinks, uh, would tell him what a great guy he was. Though that wasn't a crime, to investigators it went a long way in explaining how the three victims could have been manipulated into being alone with the killer. Hey, how you doing? I'm detective. Detectives wanted to speak with George Russell about the murders. He claimed he didn't know anyone named Carol Beathy or Randy Levine. However, he admitted knowing Marianne Polreich. In fact, he had seen her at a bar the night before she was found murdered. But, he said, they weren't there together and didn't speak. Recalling that fibers from a vehicle had been recovered from Polreich's body, police asked for permission to search his car. Russell claimed he had borrowed a friend's truck that night. Eager to cooperate, he gave police the address of his friend who had lent him the vehicle. The man confirmed he had lent Russell his truck several months earlier. He added that when Russell returned the vehicle the following day, there were large stains on the seats. And the interior of the car reeked from a horrible smell. It was so bad, he scrubbed the truck clean later that day. 
for investigators looking for proof that George Russell was a serial killer. That was the worst news they could hear. Investigators in Bellevue, Washington, believe that 32-year-old George Russell was responsible for a string of brutal sexual assaults and murders that had claimed the lives of three young women. Now they needed to prove it. Police located the vehicle Russell had borrowed the night that the first victim, Marianne Polwright, was killed, hopeful it contained evidence of murder. But in the days following the homicide, the truck had been thoroughly cleaned by its owner. But beneath the upholstery, technicians located a suspicious stain. It appeared to be blood. However, it was too degraded for a more comprehensive analysis. Fiber samples from the vehicle's carpet were also collected. At the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab, examiners compared the fibers recovered from the truck to those collected from the body of Marianne Polreich. Though they were consistent with one another, supervising forensic scientist Terry McAdam knows that no analysis is perfect. We can't say that that fiber came from that car because unless we can take the exact fiber and match up its ends, we can't say that. What we can say is the fiber we found in a suspect's car matches that found on the uh, clothing of the victim as regards to having similar microscopic characteristics. We can't say it's a match. Still, the finding was enough to allow investigators to obtain a search warrant for the suspect's apartment. There, they found a gym bag filled with slips of paper with women's names and phone numbers written on them. Police contacted several of the women whose names were found in Russell's home. Most knew George Russell well. Though many had no idea how he got their phone numbers, they didn't feel threatened. Russell had told them he was an undercover cop. Homicide detective Dale Foote. We kept hearing these same stories about George working for the police and, and being an undercover agent and that kind of thing. Um, George was a very articulate, a very charismatic young man. And uh, a lot of people bought into his story. And, uh, and uh, actually, the fact that they bought, in, bought into his story uh, kind of was a hindrance to us because they'd rather trust George than they would rather trust the police. Get up and get back with you. But one of the women contacted felt differently and she had an interesting story for police. She said that recently, George Russell had given her an antique ring. It was his way of apologizing for standing her up on a date the week before. Though she had suspicions that the ring had been stolen, she reluctantly accepted the gift. Shortly after that, she learned Russell was a suspect in the murders. When she began to hear that George was involved or possibly involved with these homicides, she became frightened. And she gave this ring to, to another friend of hers who had, just happened to be leaving town. He was on his way to uh, Florida. And so he took that ring with him. And having arrived down there a little short of cash, he went down to a, a pawn shop and pawned this ring. Fortunately, that ring was still there when we called. Investigators confirmed that it was the same ring that had been stolen from Randy Levine's room at the time of her murder. Convinced they had the serial killer, investigators next looked to tie the suspect to the murder of Marianne Polreich. Detective Marvin Skeen decided to take advantage of a new forensic technology called DNA testing. At the time in 1991, uh, introducing DNA evidence into court was the first time that it had occurred in King County in the state of Washington. So it was new, very new, and 
Uh, it was something that had to be looked at and uh, a lot of time spent on uh, to make sure that we did it properly and to get it accepted by the court. It was time well spent. On January 10, 1991, examiners determined that George Russell's DNA matched the biological samples found on Marianne Polreich. He was subsequently charged with her murder. Based on the hair analysis, he was also charged with the murders of Carol Beathy and Randy Levine. Police believe that George Russell used his abundant charm to lure women into his web. And once he had them where he wanted, he pounced on the unsuspecting victims. George Waterfield Russell was convicted of the three murders. He was sentenced to two consecutive life terms, plus 28 years. George is a professional listener, not because he really cares, but because that's the way he takes your defenses down and can do whatever he wants. Now, I spent three hours with George at Walla Walla Penitentiary and I, I, I mean, this is this is one of the most horrendous killers that ever lived. But it was it was a delightful three hours. He's interesting on every subject. Uh, he's friendly. He smiles and he cracks little jokes. Um, that's all the exterior. What there is beneath that, I don't think even George knows. Shock value was part of George Russell's murderous plan and he went to great lengths manipulating his crime scenes to achieve it. Oftentimes, the significant facts of a case lie just below the troubled surface. Just north of Detroit, Michigan, lies the city of Hazel Park. Its three square miles are home to 8,000 families, and in 1999, one ugly scandal. On the afternoon of Monday, August 16th, the Hazel Park police dispatcher received a frantic call. What took place? A man reported that his wife had accidentally shot herself. When the responding officer arrived a few minutes later, Michael Fletcher, a prominent local attorney, was waiting outside his home. His wife was inside. He had checked for a pulse, but she wasn't breathing. He led the officer to the bedroom, where his 29-year-old wife, Leanne, lay on the floor. Following protocol, the officer kept Michael Fletcher from entering the room. But there was nothing anyone could do. Leanne Fletcher was dead, the result of a single gunshot wound to the head. Any shooting death, even an accidental one, is treated as a crime scene. And this one was no different. Crime scene technicians began processing the room, looking for evidence to help them reconstruct what had happened. They collected the 45 caliber handgun found inches away from the victim's body. Unsure of what to make of the findings, police began searching through the contents of the victim's purse, looking for a suicide note she may have left behind. But what they found was a greeting card from her husband. He was expressing his joy over Leanne's recent pregnancy. Leanne Fletcher's body was removed for autopsy. For investigators, all of the findings suggested the expectant mother's death had resulted from a tragic accident.
Police in Hazel Park, Michigan, continued to investigate the tragic shooting death that had claimed the life of 29-year-old expectant mother, Leanne Fletcher. The victim's husband, Michael Fletcher, was brought in to make a statement. The 29-year-old attorney couldn't believe that his pregnant wife was dead. Michael told police that after dropping off their three-year-old daughter earlier that morning, he and Leanne went to a local firing range. He wanted her to learn how to properly shoot a handgun in case she ever needed to protect herself and the children. At first, Leanne was hesitant to handle the weapon. But according to Michael, she finally became comfortable and then fired a few rounds. When the couple returned home, Michael wanted to clean up and change clothes before heading off to work. He asked Leanne to load bullets into the clip and then put the weapon in its case that he kept by the side of the bed. The next thing he knew, he heard a shot and rushed out to find his wife bleeding to death. He was certain that the safety was on when he handed her the weapon. And he didn't remember that there was a round already in the chamber. As a matter of procedure, investigators collected the shirt Fletcher had been wearing at the time of the accident for testing. Though Michael Fletcher's account was consistent with an accidental shooting, as a matter of routine, investigators needed to interview the couple's friends and family members. When questioned, the victim's mother was upset and angry. She said she never trusted Michael Fletcher, and she was convinced her daughter's death was no accident. Nearly six months earlier, Leanne had complained to her mother she was unhappy in the marriage and wanted a divorce. When she confronted her husband, he was furious to learn she had gone so far as to hire a divorce lawyer. But soon after, Michael began trying to repair the marriage. He had just started to earn a substantial income and the mother believed he was simply trying to avoid having to pay alimony. The information led investigators to take a closer look at Leanne's death. They forwarded the 45 caliber handgun to forensic examiners, believing it possible that the gun had misfired in the hands of an inexperienced Leanne Fletcher. Using weights attached to the trigger, they found that to successfully discharge the weapon, a significant amount of force had to be applied. It was unlikely that the gun would have accidentally gone off on its own. But that still left investigators with the possibility, however unlikely, that the expectant mother had taken her own life. At autopsy, medical examiner Dr. L.J. Dragovich looked for signs of suicide. Though large blood stains were found on the victim's hands, he could find no gunpowder residue or mist-like blood spatter, which are usually present with self-inflicted gunshot wounds. There will be fine mist of blood created by the bullet impacting the skin and causing the wound. I would have been able to see evidence of that uh, fine mist droplet pattern on the hand um, of the victim herself. That was not there. When he examined the wound, he noticed that the size and shape of the powder burns, or stippling patterns on Leanne's head, were consistent with the weapon having been fired from less than two feet away. 
The bullet had entered from above and behind the victim's right ear. Based on his findings, Dr. Dragovich concluded that it would be nearly impossible for Leanne Fletcher to have held the gun in the position needed to account for the trajectory of the bullet. It's very uncomfortable to try to self-inflict the injury in the way that um, you have to be a contortionist to be able to do that. In addition to having an arm long enough, this, this is not uh, physically possible. Though the findings were powerful, they didn't prove Michael Fletcher had killed his wife. Still, rumors began to circulate through the small community. Freelance writer Tom Henderson followed the story and conducted his own investigation. But as an outsider, he knew that uncovering the truth would not be easy. I gathered the information by just basic reporting. You, you get used to, when you're a, a reporter, being outside your comfort zone, girding yourself up to knock on that door with people that don't really want to see you, saying, hi, I want to do a book about your family's tragedy. Will you cooperate? Slowly, people opened up to Henderson. Those close to the couple did not speak kindly about the young attorney. But they all agreed that Leanne was a supportive and dedicated mother and a wonderful human being. Leanne F Fletcher, by all accounts, uh, was everybody's best friend. And that's, that was one of the touching things is you would interview friends, uh, sisters. Everybody said, Leanne was my best friend. Michael Fletcher was asked to come into the station to answer questions. Stating he had nothing to hide, he agreed, but only under the watchful eye of his attorney. He admitted to police that his marriage had been shaky, but over the past several months, he said that he and Leanne had managed to reconcile their differences. In fact, just two days before her death, Leanne prepared a special dinner for the family. She used the occasion to have the couple's daughter announce to everyone that there was going to be a new baby in the family. Michael was elated. Though he couldn't explain the evidence surrounding Leanne's death, he insisted he was still very much in love with his wife. In the four or five months before the shooting, they were, by all accounts, the happiest that they'd ever been. Uh, she told her family, her sisters, her friends that he was finally being the guy that she'd wanted him to be. Though the medical examiner's findings had led investigators to suspect foul play, they struggled to find evidence to support that theory. Police went to the shooting range where Michael had taken Leanne on the morning of her death. The manager of the range recalled the couple well. He said he never saw the victim fire the gun. And despite her husband's persistence, she refused even to handle it. That contradicted Michael Fletcher's story that Leanne fired the weapon. Investigators theorized Michael had organized the trip to the shooting range in order to get gunpowder residue on his wife's hands before he shot her. If that were the plan, it failed. But for those following the investigation, the case against Michael Fletcher was hardly clear cut. There wasn't a shred of hard evidence that proved Fletcher had murdered his wife. And there was no obvious motive. Mick Fletcher didn't stand to gain anything financially from her death. There was no insurance policy. The house, in fact, was in her name, and her parents ended up being uh, responsible for its sale. Uh, 
his family didn't get any of the proceeds. He didn't get any of the proceeds. There was no financial gain. However, the medical examiner's findings were enough to allow investigators to obtain a warrant to search the suspect's house. Hidden in Michael's closet, they uncovered a secret stash of emails, photographs, and love letters. But the items had nothing to do with Michael's wife, Leanne. It appeared Michael Fletcher had a mistress. And more surprisingly, she was a respected district court judge. Police in Hazel Park, Michigan, suspected that the shooting death of 29-year-old expectant mother, Leanne Fletcher, was no accident. While looking for evidence to prove that her husband, prominent local attorney Michael Fletcher, was responsible, investigators learned he had been having an affair with a respected district court judge. Detectives went to interview the 32-year-old judge. When confronted with the evidence, she admitted she and Michael had been involved in a romantic relationship for about a year. She said she last saw Michael the night before Leanne died. He had come by her house. Michael hadn't mentioned that Leanne was pregnant. In fact, he told his mistress that he and Leanne lived like strangers and the only reason he stayed in the marriage was for the sake of his young daughter. His true feelings were for the judge. The judge, who was also married, was tolerant of the situation, at least for the time being. But she had one condition. If she found out that Michael was being intimate with Leanne, the judge would end the relationship immediately. Hazel Park homicide detective Thomas Clayman realized he had just uncovered a possible motive. When Mr. Fletcher found out that his wife was pregnant, uh, caused us to believe that she could not find out, the judge could not find out, because if they were having sexual relations per her, the relationship would be over. Detectives soon learned that it was more than just an affair that was at stake for Michael Fletcher. Emmy ruled it a homicide. In her statements to police, the judge admitted that after she and Fletcher became involved, she had helped his career. She made him the court-appointed attorney in dozens of cases, more than any other local attorney. It translated into thousands of dollars of extra income for the ambitious lawyer. Crime writer Tom Henderson knew this story was as compelling as it was tragic. This case is about a set of dynamics that you, you would only expect to come across in a made-for-TV movie. You've got the really good-looking young attorney. You've got the really good-looking vivacious wife. You've got the powerful, young, pretty judge. The triangle, the classic triangle. And you've got uh, a dead woman on a floor. Uh, it just caught everybody's attention. This shows that he knew she was pregnant. Though police believed they had finally established a motive, they struggled to find solid physical evidence that could prove Michael Fletcher was a cold-blooded killer. Because I want to make sure... But there was one item that had not been tested. The shirt Fletcher wore at the time of the shooting. After reviewing the suspect's statement, Detective Clayman realized the shirt might contain proof of the young attorney's guilt. He stated that he was not in the room when the gunshot went off. Uh, prosecutors wanted that shirt to test uh, for the possibility of blood spatter or mist being on that shirt. Uh, from the naked eye, uh, the shirt observed to be uh, clean or without stain. Uh, the human eye, you could not see any of the stains. It was then taken to uh, Michigan State Police Crime Lab. Under a magnifying glass, examiner David Woodford could find no traces of blood. But then, on the cuff of the right sleeve, he noticed tiny mist-like stains.
Looking to identify the substance, Woodford placed the shirt under a stereo microscope. Under the high-powered lens, he determined that the minute stains were in fact human blood. Their mist-like pattern was consistent with being high-velocity blood spatter, which are produced by the blowback from a firearm. The evidence contradicted Michael Fletcher's claim that he was not in the room when his wife was shot. More importantly, the blood on the cuff put him within two feet of the victim when the bullet struck her head. Police finally had enough evidence to arrest Michael Fletcher. And it came just in time. When police arrived, they found the suspect near a camper parked in front of the house. Michael Fletcher was placed under arrest and charged with the murder of his pregnant wife. The prosecution's contention is that this was a orchestrated, well-planned homicide that took months to carry out. He'd been nice to her for months. Uh, he'd been sweet-talking her, getting into her good graces. Bought her a card that morning, not because he loved her, but because he needed an alibi. Took her to the gun range, not because he wanted her to share a hobby with him, but because he needed to get gunpowder on her hands. But this case was not over. On August 19th, the day of Leanne's funeral, Michael Fletcher's lawyer was granted the right to a second autopsy by a renowned medical examiner. But he was at a disadvantage because the victim's body had been cleaned, embalmed, and her skull reconstructed. However, based on his experience and the size and location of the wound, he believed that it was plausible that the gunshot wound had been self-inflicted. Dr. Dragovic did, did the first autopsy, and his conclusion was pretty obvious. This is murder. Uh, this is not accidental or self-inflicted. The defense hired their own uh, medical examiner. His results weren't conclusive at all, which is fine for the defense. They, they just wanted someone to say, this is not clear cut. But ultimately, those findings were not enough to create reasonable doubt in the minds of jurors. The evidence suggested that when Michael Fletcher learned his wife was pregnant, he realized that his relationship with his mistress would be destroyed. And there was too much at stake to simply let that happen. After returning from the firing range, Michael saw his opportunity and took it. Michael Fletcher was convicted of homicide in the second degree and sentenced to life in prison. Murder is the most senseless of human tragedies. And strangely, the most compelling. Writers are compelled to write about it. Readers are compelled to read of it. And though forensics can never explain why someone is driven to kill, it can provide us with the satisfaction of bringing the guilty to justice. A southeastern Virginia community is stunned by a crime no one can believe. A pregnant woman murdered, her baby lost. Across the state, another town feels a similar shock, a brutal random slaying in a most unexpected setting. Two crimes no one could predict, with no eyewitnesses, few clues, and killers on the run. To solve the crimes, investigators must find the fatal twist.
In this program, some of the names have been changed. In Chesapeake, Virginia, on July 6, 2000, Raquel Foley came to the home of her neighbors, Martin and Melissa O'Connell. One of Melissa's co-workers had called Raquel and asked her to check on Melissa, who hadn't come into work that morning and wasn't answering her phone. Still on the line, the co-worker asked Raquel to check a back door. It was unlocked. Melissa's car was in the garage. In the kitchen, it looked like a dinner was prepared, but not eaten. Melissa was known for being on time every day and was eight months into a difficult pregnancy. The bedroom door was locked. Something was wrong. On the advice of the coworker, Raquel dialed 911 and reported her concerns to Chesapeake police. Chesapeake officers and EMTs responded immediately. Melissa had developed gestational diabetes during her pregnancy. If she had passed out in the bedroom, she could go into a diabetic coma, endangering herself and the baby. They had to get to her. Unlike the rest of the house, the bedroom was in disarray. Then they discovered a body face down in the bathtub. The expectant mother was dead. It was too late to save the baby. Melissa had bruises on her body and there was some blood on the tub. Officers radioed in the suspicious death. About that time, Melissa's husband, Martin O'Connell, pulled up to the house. He said Melissa's co-worker had called, saying something about an ambulance. An officer asked Martin to wait outside until detectives arrived to speak with him. Homicide detective Tom Downing was on duty that morning. I heard the call uh, coming out. Uh, on the uh, patrol channel that uh, the investigators were uh, requesting the uh, forensics people to respond, uh, as well as the detectives. On the route, the area. With Downing was his partner, Detective Mike Toothman. It is standard procedure for homicide detectives to respond to any suspicious death. Hey, Lieutenant, what we got? An officer briefed them on what they knew so far. A dead body, signs of possible ransacking in the bedroom, an unlocked back door, and the woman's husband just informed of the death. Martin O'Connell was uh, sitting up against the front of the house, uh, adjacent to the garage door, with his head down. He seemed to be uh, very distraught, and I asked him if he would, wouldn't mind coming into uh, the vehicle so Detective Toothman and myself can interview him. Martin told the detectives he had been trying to get in touch with Melissa that morning. He hadn't seen her since the night before. He had indicated he had no idea what had, what had happened to his wife. During the interview, we were able to clearly observe a number of abrasions, uh, as well as a bandaged finger. When we questioned him about that, he said that he and his wife had had a fight the previous night. Martin said that the night before, he and Melissa began arguing. At one point, he tried to quiet her by putting his hand up to her mouth. What are you crazy? Get out! She was so angry, she bit him on the finger, hard. He said she kicked him out of the house, so he went driving around nearby Virginia Beach. He told Detective Toothman he tried to get back in touch with Melissa. He had called back to the house on his cell phone and left numerous messages on his uh, digital voice recorder. 
uh, during that time, he was saying things about uh, being lost in Virginia Beach. Um, Melissa, pick up the phone. I'm sorry we fought. According to Martin, after several hours, he came back home, hoping he and Melissa could work things out. But in the garage, he found some of his clothes with a note from Melissa telling him not to come back that night. He switched cars and left. Uh, I'm not really sure. Martin told the detectives that he checked into a local hotel. I had asked him at this point uh, about the abrasions on his arms and elbows and the hands. Martin explained that after checking into the hotel, he went to a local bar and had a few drinks. Okay, and I see that you've got some fresh He said outside the bar, he tripped and fell, cutting his arms. The detectives asked if they could document the injuries. Martin agreed, saying he would do anything to help. The detectives next talked with Raquel Foley, the neighbor who first entered the house, and Cheryl Ramsdell, Melissa's co-worker, to get more information about Melissa. What we learned about Melissa O'Connell during this investigation was that she was just a, a nice person. She uh, you know, did everything right. She was a loving, devoted wife. She couldn't wait to be a, a loving, devoted mother. Everybody that knew her uh, liked her, loved her. And uh, it, was, it was just a, a tragedy that, uh, that she was taken so early. The women believed Melissa and Martin had a strong relationship. They also um, said Melissa was very security conscious, almost paranoid, and always kept the house locked tight. No physical, OK? All right, thank you very Investigators much. Investigators hoped the crime scene would provide some answers. Before processing the scene, senior forensics technician Nick Pazillo videotaped everything. The master bedroom was in a complete, total state of disarray. Everything was trashed. Uh, the drawers were dumped out. The rest of the house looked absolutely immaculate, except for this one room. It looked more like a ransacking than signs of a struggle. There was a lack of blood in the area. We didn't notice blood anywhere. Uh, and at that point, we really didn't know what we had. From the toilet, the technicians recovered a partially smoked cigarette. Around the tub, they found several broken candlesticks and a pair of shorts. Also near the tub were the first signs of blood for forensics technician Grover Davis. The water was discolored in the bathtub, and there was a little bit of staining around the bathtub area and the floor area. They collected samples for later study at the crime lab. To the investigators, it looked like a murder. Now they had to find out who would have wanted Melissa O'Connell and her unborn child dead. Police in Chesapeake, Virginia, were investigating the death of Melissa O'Connell, eight months pregnant with her first child. Evidence gathered in the bathroom where the body was found indicated murder. We were thinking that there was a, a good possibility that she may have been placed in the bathtub um, uh, after she was killed. The investigators continued checking the rest of the house. Everything seemed normal. They confiscated the answering machine in case it held any clues. I surveyed the entire perimeter of the house uh, from the outside and the inside, checking all points of entry, all doors and windows. Uh, found everything to be locked and secured. There was no sign of forced entry with the exception of uh, the back door, which was open. Investigators believed the ransacking was staged. If the person came in to burglarize the house, why didn't they go to other rooms of the house where there were more valuable items than there were in the, in the bedroom? I was very uh, concerned uh, after leaving the crime scene because things just were not were quickly not adding up. They needed more information. As promised, Martin O'Connell, the victim's husband, 
came to the police station that afternoon for another interview. Detectives were having a hard time eliminating him as a suspect. Family and friends had told police Melissa never allowed smoking in the house, so they believed the killer smoked the cigarette found in the toilet after the murder. We found that Martin O'Connell was uh, a smoker and that he did smoke that brand of cigarette. He again went over his actions on the night in question. The impression that I had was that he was very intent on giving us his alibi. But the detectives noticed that several times some small details of his story changed. They confronted him directly. The interview had started to turn into an interrogation. And at that point, uh, Martin basically shut down. He said he was tired, he wanted to go home. He agreed to meet with me the next morning and finish up the interview. And he also said that he would agree to a polygraph. What really concerned us was uh, the fact that he had never asked how his wife had, had died. Never asked anything about where she was found. Uh, didn't uh, ask any questions about the baby. And uh, this was uh, very significant because, you know, normally so that would be the first thing that somebody would want to uh, know. You know, they would wanna, they'd want to know these things. Perhaps the autopsy would provide more clues. Dr. Leah Bush led the medical team. When I first examined Melissa's body, I was struck by the number of bruises and scratches over her body, which indicated significant blunt force trauma. This woman had been beaten up. It was definitely a murder. Defensive injuries indicated Melissa fought back. She fought for her life. She tried to protect herself and her unborn child from being strangled and beaten to death. They had to prove who killed the mother and unborn child. Detective Downing asked Dr. Bush about Martin O'Connell's bite mark. Martin said he was facing Melissa when he put his hand up to her face. That is far more consistent with somebody having their hand over a person's mouth, trying to muffle their screams or using it as a control mechanism, and then she bit the finger because that on the side because that was the part of the finger close to her such as this. And when she bit his finger, it wasn't a playful bite. A large piece of flesh was missing. This was somebody who was biting in an attempt to save their life. As each new fact emerged, Martin O'Connell looked more suspicious. But investigators had no solid evidence against him or anyone else. Homicide detectives Mike Toothman and Tom Downing still did not even know exactly where Melissa had been murdered. It had been made to look like a burglary, which we could tell it, it didn't make sense. It wasn't a burglary. Uh, we needed the forensics to tell us exactly what did happen. They secured a search warrant for biological samples. I called his attorney and I told him that I had a search warrant to obtain uh, Martin's DNA, his blood, and some hair samples. Uh, and uh, he, Martin, did meet me here at uh, headquarters, and we had the paramedics uh, draw the blood and, and pull the hair samples. The samples could be useful in later lab examinations. Investigators were trying to put together what really happened on the night Melissa died. Martin claimed Melissa bit his finger during an argument downstairs. Martin had told us that the actual fight, the confrontation that they had had the previous evening occurred in the living room. And I even had him show me exactly the spot where they were at the time. After his telling us that, of course, we had the living room moving old and processed and there was no evidence of any blood there. Evidence technician Grover Davis began another search of the house, trying to determine where Melissa was attacked. The second trip that we took to the house, we found minute pieces of what we thought were blood or particles of blood 
on the door and it led all the way down to the floorboard and the and the uh, the uh, rug of the uh, of the closet. Um, we didn't notice it at first because it was so minute and the closet itself didn't appear to be touched. It was a major discovery. We ended up sawing out some of the wallboard in the closet area, the, the floor area itself, a uh, piece of carpet from the floor, any area that we felt could contain any blood evidence or hair or slot, any bodily fluids. We sent those items to the forensic lab. Police hoped the findings would point them to Melissa's killer. In July of 2000, Chesapeake, Virginia police worked to solve a heartbreaking murder, the beating and strangulation death of Melissa O'Connell, eight months pregnant with a baby girl. The prime suspect was Melissa's husband, Martin O'Connell, who had fresh injuries that he tried to explain away to police. His story seemed unlikely, and police hoped to disprove it with forensic science. At the Eastern Laboratory of the Virginia Division of Forensic Science, DNA examiner B.J. Blankenship compared the DNA from the bloodstain evidence collected at the house to the known DNA profiles of Melissa and Martin O'Connell. On the carpet, the original blood sample that I found uh, matched Melissa's blood. I then went back later and found several other uh, lighter blood stains that one of them matched Martin, and three others were a mixture of blood between Martin and Melissa. When they're mixed together, that means that they were present together at the time the blood was shed. Then the examiner made another important discovery. So I was examining the carpet from the closet and as I looked down, I noticed something beside the blood stain that was red. So I picked it up with my forceps and looked under the microscope to see what it was. And lo and behold, it was a piece of skin. And you could even see the ridge detail on the skin. The ridge detail meant the skin came from the bottom of a foot, a palm, or a finger. I immediately called the, the police department to ask them if the defendant had any wounds, and he did, in fact, have a wound on his finger. To Dr. Blankenship, it was clear that Martin O'Connell was lying to police and that he was there when his wife was killed. Martin O'Connell told the police a story that the struggle occurred with his wife downstairs. The forensics told us a different story. It said that it happened upstairs in the closet. That's where the original fight occurred. Investigators kept looking for more circumstantial evidence. Melissa's friends had said the couple seemed happy, excited about the baby. But when detectives spoke to Martin's friends, they got a different story. What we had learned is that uh, he really was not planning on being a family man. I mean, that was the far furthest thing from his lifestyle. Detectives also heard unsettling news. Martin had left town. Several friends believed he was now living with relatives in Florida. Martin left the state without submitting to the polygraph examination he promised detectives he would take. Because he had not been charged, leaving was not a crime. But it was certainly suspicious. The Chesapeake detectives contacted police in West Palm Beach, Florida, who agreed to set up surveillance at the condo of one of Martin's relatives. Soon, they spotted the suspect. While West Palm Beach could not maintain 24-hour surveillance, they would do regular checks to try to keep an eye on him. In Virginia, detectives were still hoping to figure out the motive for the murder. Then, detectives received a call from a woman in San Diego, California, 
who said she had an affair with Martin while he was working in the area for a few months that year. When she learned of Melissa's death, she told them she was compelled to call. Based on that information, myself and Detective Toothman went out. We flew out to San Diego and interviewed a young lady. We had learned a lot about Martin. Um, he was at, actually in San Diego for an extended period of time, and he had met her. But he never told this young lady that uh, he was married, and certainly nothing about a, a, a child on the way, a close relationship. He told the young woman he wanted her to move to Florida so they could be together. So at that point, uh, I think that we realized that we had the motive. And please um, give me a call if anything comes to mind. It was time to bring in Martin O'Connell, if they could find him. After several weeks, Chesapeake police were ready to arrest Martin O'Connell for the murder of his pregnant wife. But the suspect had fled to Florida. He had been spotted at a relative's condo in West Palm Beach, but then disappeared. A West Palm Beach deputy tried a ruse to find him. He spoke to the relative about a property damage report Martin had filed with the condo association, saying he needed to talk to Martin about it. The relative said she did not know where Martin was, but would try to have him call. The next day, the deputy received a message from Martin O'Connell with a phone number. He called the number and told Martin he needed his signature on a form about the damage claim. Martin asked him to fax it, but the deputy insisted he needed the original signed. He had to have an address. Reluctantly, Martin gave him the address in Clearwater, Florida. The deputy immediately called the Chesapeake detectives and gave them the address. Okay, thank you very much. They, in turn, called police in Clearwater and told them about the case and their arrest warrant. Clearwater PD agreed to attempt the arrest. That's him. Officers set up surveillance at the Clearwater address. It wasn't long before Martin O'Connell showed up and was safely taken into custody and extradited back to Virginia. Prosecutors and detectives worked together to bring this emotional case to trial. In June 2002, a jury agreed on what happened the night of Melissa O'Connell's death. Just weeks before the baby was due, the couple had an argument. In Melissa's walk-in closet, Martin attacked. When he tried to stifle her screams, she bit him fighting for her life, but he was too strong. Martin O'Connell was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. At the time, Virginia law made it impossible to charge him with killing his unborn daughter, too. But because of this case, that has changed. The city of Chesapeake was shaken to the core by the brutal crime. Three hundred miles to the west, another Virginia town was in for a similar shock. On the afternoon of October 11th, 1990, Roanoke police officers Michael Warner and Tom Kincaid were preparing for their shift when a man pulled up in a rush. Yes, sir. He exited the car and he was very nervous and he told us that uh, there had been a woman that had been killed in a, a basement at uh, Subdivision just up the street. Uh, at that time, we kind of wondered if it was for real. We asked him, or was he kidding us or, or joking with us? It was no joke. The officers asked where the house was. And he said that he could take us there if we'd follow him. So we went ahead and followed him up to the house.
the officers called in the report of a possible dead body. At the house, two women were waiting. They said they were local realtors. The woman inside was a co-worker. She was in the basement, dead. The officers had to clear the house to make sure no one dangerous was inside. In the kitchen, they found a realtor's notebook and business card. They headed to the basement. In a large pool of blood lay a body. Uh, we were pretty confident looking at the victim that she was deceased and there was no uh, immediate first aid that we could give her. The officers called for detectives and crime scene technicians. Outside, the okay. other realtors said the dead woman was named Carolyn Rogers. We're not aware of. I don't think so. But after this point, she was the co-workers had come to the house looking for Carolyn when she didn't show up for lunch and found the body. None of them had seen anyone leaving the house. Roanoke County Police forensic evidence technicians soon arrived. It was up to them and the medical examiner to find the clues left behind and determine what happened inside the house. Also responding were county detectives. They would try to use those clues to find whoever was responsible. The patrol officers briefed the others on the apparent homicide. What we have inside is down in the basement, we have a white female gentleman here is found behind me. I've interviewed him. Got his Detective statement. Phil Patron knew the evidence search was critical. Um, that's kind of where we're at right now. We had no eyewitnesses that we were able to determine immediately. We had just the victim in the basement. Forensic evidence technician Rick Moorer helped process the basement. We carefully went through the scene. We began to photograph it using a 35 millimeter camera. And uh, documenting it through sketches and so forth. Medical examiner William Masello checked the body. This was uh, a middle-aged woman that was uh, lying face down, and there was a, a large pool of blood around her. Very obviously, she had uh, sustained some sort of an injury which had resulted in bleeding, be it a gunshot wound, stab wound at all. I didn't really know what it was until I got into uh, further examining the body. Body temperature indicated the woman had been dead for several hours. Here. The most obvious clues were the bloody shoe prints. Preserving them was crucial for forensic scientist supervisor Michael Grimm. At the scene, we took photographs of footwear impressions. And included in the photographs were scales to assure proper enlargement of the impressions once they were returned to the lab. A number of the impressions appeared to have been made by a female shoe based on the shape and size. In addition to that, there were footwear impressions that appeared to have been made by a much larger shoe, one with a large heel and a large sole area. The technician searched for any other clues. I discovered a, a small button that was laying in the blood. Uh, I felt that that was very important. That button did not match any of the buttons that Mrs. Rogers had on. So uh, we were very careful to collect that. The evidence suggested to police that this was definitely a murder. Investigators then looked to determine their first lead. There were no vehicles at the house. She was a realtor, and if she had to get there somehow, it... so we assumed then at least that the car was stolen. When police contacted Carolyn's family, they learned details about her car and put out an all points bulletin for it. 
Lieutenant Warner was part of the force out looking for the car. I started concentrating my efforts on large parking lots, motel rooms, and stuff like that in the area. And approximately 9, 30, 10 o'clock that evening, I was at the mall, and I happened to spot the vehicle. Uh, once I did, I laid back and watched it just for a few minutes. I noticed that there was nobody hanging around it. Dispatch, I'm going to be out on John Lincoln Charles 7865. Warner called in the discovery and did a cursory check of the vehicle. The door was locked. But inside, he could see a legal pad. looked like it had blood spots on it. If so, it could help lead to the killers. Investigators sent the pad to the crime lab for immediate analysis. Roanoke Police Chief Ray Lavender looked for other clues. We immediately notified security at uh, the mall uh, where the car was located that uh, if any other evidence or suspicious activity occurred in the area, we would like to know about it immediately. Any articles of clothing uh, that might indicate a person had changed clothing, anything at all like that. Next morning, they got a call back. Some of the maintenance personnel at the mall had located a pair of shoes and had thrown those shoes into a dumpster. We immediately went to that dumpster. We located the shoes. They had uh, small heels uh, similar to the type of shoes that may have walked through the blood at the crime scene. We labeled them uh, and uh, tagged them and immediately took them uh, as evidence and later submitted them to the lab. The investigators tried to work quickly Whoever committed such a senseless and vicious crime had to be stopped fast. Roanoke, Virginia police believed two people were involved in the brutal slaying of realtor Carolyn Rogers. Technicians found two sets of bloody shoe prints at the scene and collected a legal pad with possible blood stains from the victim's car. Yet investigators had no idea who the suspects were or where they went. They hoped more information would turn up at the autopsy. Assistant Chief Medical Examiner William Masello led the post-mortem examination. Cause of death in this uh, individual was a stab wound to the chest going right, right through the heart and the left lung. At the edge of the fatal wound, the doctor noted scalloped markings. And uh, these were very suggestive of a uh, stake-type knife or a knife with a serrated blade. The doctor also discovered a distinctive pattern of bruises on the back of the head. period blunt impacts. So this is the type of the thing you might see when some sort of an object uh, strikes the head. The wounds were photographed for comparison in case a weapon was found. The victim's family had said she always wore nice jewelry, yet none remained on the body. Bruises indicated someone had forcibly removed her ring and earrings. You got this from the bank. Though still shocked and grieving, Carolyn's husband did what he could to help. Are those the three checks here at the bottom? He had reviewed the couple's Marcia bank accounts and discovered a check cashed the day of the murder. Marcia J. Smith. $500 for house cleaning services. We don't have a house cleaning service detective. He told Detective Phil Patrone it was a forgery. Our checks. Made out to a person that Mr. Rogers didn't know. In fact, Mr. Rogers made it very clear to us that they didn't have a house cleaning service. A detective went to the bank and spoke to the manager there. The manager had saved the canceled check, made out to a Marsha J. Smith. At the Virginia Division of Forensic Science, examiners did the processing. 
To develop any unseen fingerprints, the forged check was sprayed with ninhydrin aerosol. Ninhydrin reacts to secretions from human skin that transfer easily to porous surfaces. The legal pad found in the victim's car was also processed. Forensic scientist Michael Grimm introduced heat and steam from a household iron to cause the reaction. Several partial fingerprints were revealed. He then turned to the legal pad. During that examination, a fingerprint was developed in the lower right-hand corner on the front page of the notepad. This fingerprint was photographed and subsequently entered into Virginia's automated fingerprint identification system, also known as APHIS. Within a matter of minutes, a potential hit was returned uh, to the laboratory. It was for a woman named Wendy Horst. Detective Patron called in the hit. An address was found for Marcia Smith, whose name appeared on the forged check. Detectives traveled to Blacksburg, Virginia, to interview her. Wendy Horst. Do you know anything about Marcia did know Wendy Horst. She used to work with her. Um, and Marcia had recently lost her license. My, my driver's license. I appreciate you taking it was all around the same time Horst left town. Detectives believed Horst stole the license, then used it to cash the forged check. Thank you. Detective Kern soon received a background check on Wendy Horst. She was the girlfriend of a known violent offender named Danny King. Danny was pretty much a career criminal. He had been involved in a number of crimes, a number of violent crimes. He had just gotten out of uh, prison. He'd been out of prison 10 days when this offense occurred. Danny was uh, just absolutely uh, a ruthless uh, criminal. Roanoke police went to King's last known address and spoke with a relative Hi, there. Yes, I am. She was a very cooperative person. She was very uh, sorry for the uh, reasons that we were there. The woman yes, said Wendy uh, Horst had lived with her yes. until Danny got out of prison recently. You saw him. What were they doing? She had observed a license plate taken off the female accomplice's vehicle, put onto a van that uh, Danny and his accomplice had just driven in with one day. Uh, on the 11th. The day after the Rogers murder, the couple left town. And they were in a rush to leave. Investigators did not know where the pair had gone, but now they had a license plate number. They entered the plate, as well as descriptions of the van and the two suspects, into the National Crime Information Center's computer system and put out a nationwide teletype requesting law enforcement agencies across the country to look out for the couple. The chances were slim. The couple could be anywhere. Then, on October 15th, just four days after the murder, a state trooper on patrol in New Philadelphia, Ohio, spotted a van at a rest area. November Charlie, 7406. On a gold he called in the plates caravan. and learned the van was possibly connected to a murder in Virginia. 518, if you'll send me a 10 The trooper called for backup. Back Two brutal killers might be inside. Four days after realtor Carolyn Rogers was murdered in Roanoke, Virginia, Police 350 miles northwest in New Philadelphia, Ohio, spotted the van associated with the two suspects. As soon as other state troopers arrived as backup, they moved in. Pass. Stick your hands out the window. Drop 
Driver, get your hands out the window. Hands out the window. In the passenger seat was Wendy Horst. Come out of the car nice and easy and face forward. The driver was Danny King. The two were taken into custody without a struggle. She ain't got nothing to do with this. She ain't got nothing to do with this. In their preliminary search of the van, Ohio troopers noticed a key ring with the logo of the victim's real estate company. They also spotted a knife, a knife. with a serrated blade. Okay, Ohio talk. authorities contacted Roanoke Police Chief Ray Lavender. I had uh, received word from the Ohio Highway Patrol that they had located uh, uh, Danny King and his accomplice. I got the first flight out of Roanoke, which was about 4 a.m. the next morning. After getting a warrant, the Roanoke police conducted a full search of the suspect's van. They found some clothing, both male and female, that appeared to have blood on it. One piece caught their attention. We also located a work shirt uh, with a missing button. And the reason that was important to us is that we had found a button at the crime scene. And the buttons on that shirt were identical to those we found at the crime scene. Uh, we also recovered a pair of boots that we believed belonged to Mr. King. We were particularly interested in those. Their soles would be compared to the bloody crime scene shoe prints. That tread pattern looks very familiar. Investigators also collected the knife Ohio troopers had spotted. After collecting the evidence, the detectives went to interview Wendy Horst. She admitted to forging the check and pawning the ring. She said that she was present at the house at the time of the murder, but swore she did not see it actually happen. She said that she really didn't know what happened, uh, that uh, Mr. King was in the basement with a real estate agent, and he came out of the basement, ordered her to get in the car and drive uh, to the local mall. As the interview continued in Ohio, examiners in Virginia processed two more forged checks that had been recovered. Prints were lifted from the new checks and compared to King's known prints. Those fingerprints were positively identified as fingerprints of Danny King. That's it, that's it, that's a match. It was time to interview King. No, 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 King denied having anything to do with the murder. He didn't find my finger. There would be no confession. Well, I'm just to prove what happened, investigators turned to forensic evidence. So maybe they're wrong. Michael Grimm checked the shoe prints photographed at the scene against the recovered shoes. The examiner reported a strong association between the high heels and the smaller crime scene prints. And a positive match between the boots and the larger prints. Next, he checked the reproductions and inked impressions of the suspect's feet against the wear on the inside of the shoes. He reported similar findings. Horst could not be eliminated as the primary wearer of the heels, and Danny King was an exact match with the boots. It is our opinion that these characteristics are unique to that shoe. The lab findings were exactly what Commonwealth's attorney Randy Leach needed for trial. It would have been a very difficult case to prosecute without the forensic evidence. In June 1991, the prosecutor used the forensic evidence to prove to a jury what happened to Carolyn Rogers. She can't meet us at like 10 in the morning. Okay. Cool. okay. But don't use your name. Danny King had his girlfriend call some realtors, allegedly to look at a house. See if she can meet us earliest time. 
Carolyn Rogers had the misfortune to take the call. Look at one of your houses on Jefferson Street. Yes, the morning would be best. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Cool. So you meet us. Let's go. Pure and simple, the motive behind the crime was robbery. Danny King had been in the penitentiary for a number of years and had been out for 10 days. He had no income, and the crime was committed to get Carolyn Rogers jewelry, her checkbook, any cash she might have had, so they would have money to go out of state on a honeymoon trip. When they got to the basement, King's girlfriend decided to go outside for a cigarette. Yeah. I'm gonna go have a cigarette. Leaving Danny uh, King alone with Carolyn. Danny King was a dangerous man. He didn't care who he had to hurt to get what he wanted. He killed her and robbed her. They parked the victim's car at a local mall where Danny wiped it down to get rid of any fingerprints. Get in the bed! Take off your shoes! Leave them! He made his girlfriend leave her shoes. He thought he had erased any trace of their passage, any connection between them and the murder. The Roanoke investigators and lab examiners found all the evidence they needed. You know Fingerprints, shoe prints, even a shirt button. We were able to show the jury that not only had he stabbed her, and not only did she die a horrible death there, but that she had been stomped in the head with his boot. That went a long way toward convicting Danny King and, and the ultimate punishment being imposed. Danny King guilty of forgery, robbery, and murder, and recommended the death penalty. He was executed on July 23, 1998. His accomplice was convicted of accessory after the fact and received five years. She has since been released. Many homicide victims place themselves in dangerous situations. When the purely innocent are taken, police and forensic examiners work especially hard to find answers in the fatal twist.